Um, good morning. My name is Linda Holden. My husband Bob was diagnosed with metastatic male breast cancer in January 2003. I am his caregiver. And I would like to tell you about our guest speakers, Liz Sherwood and Mimi Alvarez. Liz is the coordinator for the Carolina Wells Survivorship Program. She helps provide programs that empower cancer survivors and their families to have the highest possible quality of life. The programs include integrative medicine, yoga, massage, acupuncture, exercise, and nutrition and emotional support for moving towards wellness after cancer, including addressing body image concerns, stress management, and dealing with uncertainty. And Mimi, Mimi Alvarez is a clinical nurse specialist with the UNC Comprehensive Cancer Support Program. Mimi provides counseling to patients and their families. She sees patients of all ages in all clinical programs from pediatric oncology to geriatric oncology. So welcome. Thank you. And I'll let you. Thank you. And before I have to get in front of the microphone, <laughs> before I do start today, too, I do want to express, and I think I can speak for my uh, colleague Mimi, how grateful we are to be able to be here and um, share this experience with you. I know just from the talk this morning, I um, felt so um, overwhelmed by the message that I was hearing, and so we are very grateful to be able to be here to share this time with you. What we were asked to speak with you today about is caregiver support. And one of the ways that we, um, in terms of the support program at UNC, like to think about this is how do we help you as a caregiver, as well as when we're working with patients, foster resilience. And what we mean by that is that we know that anybody under stress can have perhaps a menu of ways that they choose to deal with that stress. We know some work better than others, but we also know that in general, we're oftentimes creatures of habit, right? So we do the same things over and over again. And part of our discussion here today is I want to encourage you um, because as a caregiver and as a caregiver of someone living with metastatic disease, you are aware that any given day, you may not know what is going to be presented as the challenges, and that in of itself can be a stressor. And when you find yourself in that way of knowing that there's a higher level of frustration or there's a sense that things aren't going the way that you feel would be more um, uh, met with a level of contentment, if you will, that instead of looking that necessarily as that there is something the matter, is that you allow yourself to look at it as a problem that then moves into being able to come up with solutions to a problem. So we're going to talk with that about that a little bit today. And that is oftentimes what they mean when you talk about adaptation. That's where we're going with the idea of positive adaptation, is that you can identify where the challenges are. You can look at it as a challenge and then figure out some different ways of meeting that challenge. When you are being a care provider or a caregiver to someone with metastatic cancer and metastatic breast cancer, as you all, I'm sure, can tell me much more clearly, is that, as I said, from day to day, week to week, month to month, and sometimes ideally year to year, that skill set that you may have from at one point may need to be changed sometimes so that you feel like you're meeting those needs as well as your own needs, and that's what we're gonna address a lot today in a way that helps you to be in it for the long haul. When we think about resilience, we think about addressing that in a whole variety of ways. And just like our well-being in general and our physical health, if we think about it, we are very complex people we are complex beings, and the way to think about that is as we move forward in life, there are physical needs, there are emotional needs, 
there are mental needs and there are spiritual needs. And we're all very different in how we go about addressing those needs. But the idea of today's presentation is to give you, if you will, a menu for you to consider and then choosing those things that resonate with you. We're not here to tell you how to do anything or to make it sound like you should be doing something that you may not be doing. What we're here to do is to give you a variety of options of different types of things that you might want to incorporate, whether it's into your day, into your week, as something that might be helpful during this time. We do know that all of you have been on a roller coaster ride in lots of different ways, from diagnosis to staging to treatment to side effects of treatment to dealing with symptoms. And many of you um, are also dealing with work-related issues and financial-related issues. And so there are oftentimes many types of stressors. And that can be one of the first things in helping you to become more resilient, is to pinpoint where those things are that you know are really challenging you. So when we talk about the physical realm, I was thinking about this this morning. And um, I was thinking about how um, in some native cultures, as well as even in our military, we do this physical training to enable us to endure rough patches in life. And so I do want to encourage you all to think about how do you help yourself to be physically stronger. For some people, this can be you know, physical activity or physical exercise. For some people, it may be improving other parts of their life. I work a lot in a variety of capacity. I know for some people, when I, I have learned to say not exercise, but activity, because some people don't like that connotation. But what we do know is most people feel better when their bodies move, whether that's stretching, whether that's dancing, but to allow yourself to get back in touch with helping your body to feel stronger. When we're under a lot of stress, we know we carry that physically, right? People get headaches, you get shoulder aches, your shoulders start to go up. And if we can help our bodies relax, it can also help you to feel stronger. As was mentioned this morning, and I think that this is true for caregivers too, is that many people also will experience disruptions in sleep and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But it is a very important um, part of our quality of life. We do know that eating more healthfully is something that does make a difference. Most people, when we're under stress, we want comfort foods, right? Comfort foods can be something that's very important to incorporate in our lives. but. We do know if they're comfort foods that are high sugar or high carbohydrates, that in the long run, those foods are not going to help you feel better. So I do want for you all to consider your diet in the sense that you know, if you're not incorporating enough protein, you look and figure out different ways that you know you might like to get more protein in your life, incorporating fruits and vegetables. Start where you are. This isn't about having to eat a certain way, but it is acknowledging that foods do impact how we feel and can be something that we incorporate to help us to feel better. This is um, from the Harvard School of Public Health. I think it's, for most people, pretty common knowledge. But what we do know is that foods that are highly processed, probably in the long run, don't make us feel better. So if you are eating a diet that is more prepared foods, et cetera, et cetera, just begin to incorporate some foods into your daily routine that are what I call more whole foods. I don't espouse any specific diet for people. What I just encourage you to do is eat real food. <laughs> And exercise, as I mentioned, has lots of benefits. Some other benefits that I do want to encourage you to think about is that it can also reduce fatigue. I know for many of you who are living with a um, 
family member, a partner, a friend that is dealing with metastatic breast cancer, that fatigue may be a big part of their life. It's also something that we know caregivers experience. You know, you are also at this for ideally a very long time. And what we mean by fatigue is that can be a sense of physical fatigue, it can be a sense of emotional fatigue, it can be a sense of mental fatigue, and that is where when Mimi addresses some of the other areas that you might find helpful is just being in the situation with a loved one where you can't fix it. You can do lots of things to try to make it better, but you can't fix it, is in itself a very fatiguing and stressful place to be. So that's part of where we're trying to help with some ideas that might help you move forward. So this morning when um, we heard about sleep, this is something that um, my colleagues would definitely say that I've been on a soapbox for about the last 15 years about. I think that now we know from the research, right, lack of sleep, haha, ha, um, is bad for us. It's a very, very common experience, not only for people who are dealing with cancer, but their caregivers. It is hard when you know that you're waking up with that list of things to do or you're not falling asleep because you get on what I call the hamster wheel and it's dark and it's quiet and you begin to think of all the what ifs or all the worries. If you are noticing that you are, you know, that you're experiencing sleep problems, allow there to be some discussion around that. And what I mean by that is if that's first with yourself to say, okay, you know, I'm not sleeping well, I have to stop drinking coffee after two o'clock in the afternoon, even though I'm absolutely exhausted by five, you know, to look at those sorts of variables in your life, to potentially talk with your primary care provider that you are experiencing sleep and you would like some help with that. Some people will do it purely environmentally and what I mean by that, there was just a research study that came out um, recently, I'm sure it's not news to most of the people in the room, that sleeping in a cooler room helps people to sleep better. So if it's something as simple as temperature in the room, lights in the room, et cetera, you know, not having the TV on, not checking your phone messages right before you go to bed, <laughs> um, those sorts of things, to allow yourself that um, comfort. What we do know is lack of sleep not only begins to wear on you physiologically speaking, but as I tell many of the people I work with, because what we see in the clinic a lot, and this is with patients, not caregivers, but I don't think that the concerns are that different, is people usually don't tell their health care provider until they are so sleep deprived that they're falling apart. And my comment to people about that is we use sleep deprivation as a form of torture. The reason it is a form of torture is because it makes you not think clearly. It makes you want to, you have no frustration tolerance. You know, you'll take the, best, the fastest and the easiest way out of a situation in terms of coping. And so that's what sleep deprivation does to all of us. You know, ideally it's not at that level, but the side effects are the same. So it is something to really consider. There are, for some folks, do cognitive behavioral therapy to help with sleep, but there's a whole variety of ways to think about um, getting some help with that. And for some people who have chronic sleep issues, it may also be that you don't sleep in eight hour increments. Some people have never slept in eight hour increments. And if you look across, you know, sort of the history of man, if you will, that wasn't how people slept. They took naps in the afternoon because they got up at four and five o'clock in the morning and started doing work. They went in just like what we know from agricultural, you know, in the farm societies, even in the Midwest. You came in, you had a big lunch, you took a break, and then you went out and you started all over again in terms of taking care of animals. So it's not that it also has to be in those big blocks of time. And I'm going to um, let Mimi come up and talk now, and then we'll... Thank you, sweet pea. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to 
iterate again what Liz said. This is a tremendous honor for us. And um, this is a conversation that we want to have. And you all should have little note cards in your bags. And um, our host is going to be collecting them. And you can ask questions. I think that may be a way in which people don't feel so on the spot of having to ask a question. But I guarantee that we're all going to have the same universal questions about this. So. The emotional capacity, um, this is really tough. I think uh, in my experience in the clinical settings, as well as my own personal experience in dealing with family members that have had cancer, for many of us, um, we want to be able to only be in the realm of positive emotions. And those are incredibly healthy. Those are incredibly important. However, part of what there's certain angst about is what to do with our frustration, what to do about our anger at the situation that we have, what to do about the guilt that we feel. And so some of the dynamics that Liz and I tend to see is that as a caregiver, you tend to stuff this all in. And we see that people hold these emotions because they, many times they don't want to talk to their partner, they don't want to talk to their spouse, their family members about this because they don't want to create more suffering for this other person. So where do you go with these emotions? Who do you talk to? Well, that's incredibly important because what we know over time is that the more you stuff inside of yourself, the more likely it's going to find a way of eking out. Does that make sense? Whether it's through your behaviors, through your own health, um, through withdrawing from people, uh, it's certainly not going to have a positive effect on you. So finding a way, a mechanism to be able to release those emotions, whether that they be physically through exercise, through walking, through journaling, through painting, through finding someone to talk to, uh, is incredibly important. We also know that, you know, being around other people, finding someone, an emotional connection, whether that be through uh, a group like this, is incredibly important as well, um, and that you feel much less alone in that process. Humor is something incredibly important as well, and. Um, I know that as having been a nurse for 26 years, sometimes we have to have a sense of humor because if we're not laughing, we'd all be crying. We'd all be crying every single day. So sometimes our, human could, our humor could be irreverent, which is not a bad thing. But what we know about the studies about positive emotion and humor is that it buffers against uh, the stress levels that are in our body. It releases chemicals that are actually healing in nature, besides just the physical act of laughing, which increases our oxygenation or increases our own muscle tones. Um, it certainly helps release some protective chemicals within our bodies to offset all these other radical chemicals that are within us that are actually inflammatory in nature. So humor, laughing, and it doesn't have to be laughing the entire day. It's laughing and, you know, about something that's happened, you know, whether that's, you know, um, dropping something on the floor or cooking a meal that didn't actually turn out all that well or finding that you have a flat tire. Again, if you, if you are laughing at something, it is actually um, in the psychological realm of people one of the highest levels of coping that there is. So it's, even though it may sound irreverent at times, it's actually psychologically incredibly healthy. So connectedness. This is really hard for a lot of us, asking for help is incredibly hard. I know that as a nurse myself, um, who actually went through breast cancer last year, the entire year, I can't tell you how hard it was to ask for help. And it's also hard to ask for help as a caregiver. You're not even sure what to ask for. And so one of the tips that is incredibly important is that you don't have to ask for everything under the sun. That would be nice, but for a lot of us, that's really hard to do. So what is it that you need help with? Is it meal preparation? Is it um, having someone come to the house for a few hours for relief so that you don't worry about going to the grocery store and then leaving somebody behind at home? Is it help with uh, the lawn, <laughs> cutting the lawn? That was a biggie for me. You know, is it help with um, 
transportation to appointments, I think for caregivers, that's incredibly hard. You're trying to balance holding down a job, the finances, and then all these appointments that happen for your, for your loved ones. And asking for help is, allows other people to give back to the greater good. Does that make sense? Uh, sometimes as a caregiver, it's incredibly draining to give and give and give, and so receiving, the act of receiving allows someone else to give, and it creates an equilibrium for all of us in our lives. So for some people, it's creating a, a master schedule every month. What are the things that I need to be doing, and where are the holes? And when your family members, when, other, when your friends come up to you and say, what can I do? It's really hard to kind of be on the spot and say, okay, well, let me think. Hmm. So maybe creating a schedule and creating lists and saying, these are where the holes are in my life right now. Who would like to step up to the plate? And that allows other people to know how they can help you because one of the things that happen for our friends and families outside of our immediate caregiving situation is that they don't know what to do. And this paralyzes them. And so giving them ideas actually helps them and knowing how to stay very connected to you. Uh, one of the things too that for caregivers is that this is a very alone journey, a very alone journey. And even though a lot of people will say, I understand, you're the only ones walking this journey right now. And it's very, very hard. So no one is really gonna understand completely what this is like for you but being with another human being, having connections, having that social connectedness, that fabric, makes you feel less alone in the process, in this journey that you're taking. So, so what about our mental capacities? Um, well, there's healthy ways of looking at things and then there's unhealthy ways of looking at things. I think setting realistic goals for yourself is a way of problem solving something that you can't fix or take away. For you as a caregiver, the hardest part is being a witness to the suffering of another person, and that's really hard. So what can you do? Um, well, there's simple things that you can do. You know, what can I fix and what can I not fix? There are certain circumstances that none of us in this room are gonna be able to take away. We can't take away the disease of another person. But what are the things that I can choose to do? I can let go of the things I can't control of, but what can I do? So one of the things is how I choose to respond to this. At the end of the day, none of us, none of us can change the circumstances that we find ourselves in life. The only thing we actually have control over is how we choose to respond to what's right in front of us. And how do you choose to respond? Um, well, it could be, you know, I'm going to respond as gracefully as I can. I'm going to try to do the very best that I can. I will be imperfect in that process. How am I going to choose to respond today? Well, I'm going to choose to let go of the things that I can't. The house is going to be dirty today. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> the laundry won't get done today. Um, we're going to have to maybe prepare this meal. I'm going to do the very best I can, you know. Um, those are the things that I can control. I can control also asking other people for help. And it's amazing how much people will be willing to help you if you just extend that hand. The parts that are not so healthy are um, perhaps being in denial, uh, perhaps withdrawing, perhaps um, going into resignation, um, finding other ways of coping through how alcohol or drugs, um, through pulling back, through not reaching out. Um, it is hard for all of us to show our true selves in that moment when we are really struggling with our own emotions. And sometimes it means asking other people for help, like people like myself and Liz, talking to someone independent of your loved ones or family, someone who will be neutral, someone who you may not feel so ashamed about telling them how tired you are, how 
hard you wish, you, you know, how, how much you wish you were in a different circumstance in the circumstances that you are. Um, and sometimes you may need medicines, um, uh, whether that be for depression or for anxiety. Um, those are, remember, those are short-term things to get you through a, a certain situation. Um, but what we know about people that are resilient are those that choose to take control over circumstances that they don't have any control over and try to seek answers for that, whether that be through um, talking to professionals or possibly, you know, saying, I can't do this all by myself. I need a few hours to, you know, recuperate and, you know, I need a few hours outside of the house in order to have time for myself. All those things are incredibly healthy. I know that sounds easier said than done, but it's the absolute truth. You need to take care of yourself. There's the saying that you can't give what you don't have. And we think of ourselves as little cars, you know. You have to put gasoline into the tank if you expect the car to keep running. You can't go running on empty without causing damage. Another incredibly important thing to do is to quiet your mind. Um, for a lot of us, uh, that have been through this journey or have been a witness to someone else's journey, shutting off the mind is probably the hardest thing. There's constant worrying, constant tension. But what we know is that that's our minds and all our constant worrying and anxiety is like being on a hamster wheel. You know, you're just like running, 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 running as fast as you can. And that actually causes incredibly more stress and more anxiety, which causes more inflammatory processes into the body, which causes more damage. And you're going to put yourself at more risk of actually becoming ill yourself. So it's not all of a sudden waking up one day and uh, being in nirvana or taking one yoga class and figuring, oh, I got this, or taking mm -hmm. one mindfulness class and saying, listen, I got this down. It's not like that at all. It's about becoming aware of what you're doing and say, OK, let me breathe and let me correct, let me find my true north again, let me find my center again. And it is a process of just going back and recalibrating yourself as much as possible. For some people, it's walking in nature. For other people, that's through prayer. For other people, it's running, exercise, painting, poetry, reading, anything that allows your mind to come to a quiet place so you can li listen to your higher, self, you know, your spiritual self, it's always a good thing. There was a very interesting study done, and I'm not condoning, I'm not saying that we all should go to the synagogue or church or whatever. This is not what it's about. But it is interesting. The people that actually had some kind of spiritual practice or meditation actually had less disease and lived longer than people who did not. So it's a very interesting process. So what about our spiritual practice? Um, those of you that, some of you that know me from UNC hear me say this quite often. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience here on Earth. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And so this is about, from a spiritual perspective, it's not dogma, it's not religion. It's about how do I fit into the greater world here? How do I make meaning of what, ha what is happening to me in my life? How, what are my beliefs that will guide me, will let me know that I'm not alone? How is this event that's happening to myself and my loved one? How do I make sense of this? The truth is, and I'm, trying, I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to get on my soapbox, but here's a greater truth. Every one of us in this room are delusional, okay? And let me tell you why. Delusion is a fixed false belief. And prior to the cancer ex diagnosis, we had a belief of what our life was going to be like. We had all these hopes and dreams. We had this trajectory that was set into a motion that, you know, for me, I'm going to be 65. I'm going to retire from UNC hospitals. I'm going to have this fabulous pension. And I'm going to travel the world. And then what happened? Something happened, right? that set us off the course. The people that actually have well-being in their lives are those that can reconstruct how they understand the world to work. Those that can find meaning and purpose in the midst of suffering. 
Viktor Frankl wrote this wonderful book, Man's Search for Meaning, and if you haven't read it, let me tell you, it's not light reading, okay? But there's truth with a capital T that in the midst of suffering, how do we make sense of what's happening to us? And how do we rework this experience of suffering into finding meaning of it? And probably a more important thing that kind of defines those people that make it from those that don't make it or have well-being is having a very strong reason for living. Having a strong reason for living. Whether that be, you know, a, a person, whether that be a pet, whether that be goals. I have seen people that have said, I've got to make it to my son's graduation. I've got to make it to my daughter's wedding. I would like to celebrate my 50th year of being married. I'd like to see the mountains again. I'd like to go to the beach again. It's amazing what the human spirit does when it says, I have something greater than myself that I'm living for, and that's incredibly important. Something that I practice myself that seems to kind of recalibrate how I see the world, because in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of negativity out there. That's why I try not to watch the news so much anymore, because it's really hard, right? But how our outlook on the world changes by how we choose to be a witness to what's around us and, and what we take notice of. And so this is a really easy thing to do, which is every day writing three things that you're grateful for, you know? And it could be simple things. I'm grateful for the meal I had. I'm grateful for having a pain-free day or maybe a pain-free few hours. I'm grateful for the conversations I had with my loved ones. I'm grateful that I didn't get a flat tire. I'm grateful that it didn't snow. I'm grateful that it's not 100 degrees outside and I didn't pass out. What am I grateful for? What I've noticed in a lot of people is that that reworks how you see the world. And the more you practice it, it's like a muscle that you exercise, the more you see it all around you. And you start shifting how you see the world around you. So where do you start? I can tell you one thing, you're not gonna go from zero to 100 very quickly, but like anything else, it's where are you looking for your silver lining? What is the first step that I'm gonna take to get there? And it may be as caregivers is saying, I'm, I need a few hours for me. How do I go about that? How do I plan that in my day? Do I go for walks? Do I try to spend a few hours by myself? Do I listen to music? And it's even not necessarily about being yourself, but it's how you are with another human being. Maybe it's about being present to another human being. So as a nurse in oncology, as a psychiatric nurse in oncology, many times for me, I can't change the outcome I can't give a pain medicine that's going to take away the suffering, but you know what is incredibly important is being present to another human being. The act of being present to another human being is incredibly healing. So at this moment, what I'd like to do is stop and have a conversation with you all and listen to your thoughts and take your questions and let's go from there. Okay. And if Liz would join me. While they're collecting the cards, yeah, that would be great. I also just want to Please. say, because I know um, one of the areas that we didn't really address here, and I'm not sure in looking at the agenda if there were other breakout sessions, is that obviously a big piece of the challenge as a caregiver are communication and communication issues. And it is something that obviously we all have our own styles of communication. Our loved ones have their own styles of communication. And as I said before, you know, many of those can be very entrenched and it can feel like we're not doing something right if we say we want it to be done differently. And so it is another one of those kinds of areas where if you can 
either um, if you're finding, for example, that you and the person that you are providing care for or just not communicating well, whether you decide to meet with someone a couple of times or whether you just try to put it on the table without any kind of judgment is to say, we need to figure out a different way of doing this um, can be very helpful as well as, and I know um, I had the um, good fortune of working with Carolyn Sartor, who was a physician at UNC, who is also um, very actively living with metastatic breast cancer. And one of the things that she talked with me a lot about is that one night her husband and herself were sitting across from each other at dinner and they realized that pretty much all they knew how to talk about at that point was breast cancer. And so they had to make a commitment to each other to sort of say, you know, it's sort of like we hear about date nights or being able to do something differently, that, you know, for one night a week or for one period of time that they were going to step out of that context and allow themselves something different. And so I just, I realized when I was looking at our slides, we didn't address that, so I wanted to say it. So. Um, the first question is, how do I encourage a caregiver to use these strategies? Any suggestions from you all? Because you're the ones who are figuring it out already. One of the things that I oftentimes um, use as a way of encouraging folks or helping people to acknowledge that there may be different ways of doing things is to say um, or to acknowledge that you've never been here before. This is the first time. As adults, we don't like to have to learn new things, but the learning curve is steep. And you can acknowledge that it's a learning process, or you can assume that you've got it all figured out. And from that, it oftentimes is giving that person, as well as yourself, permission to know that something's not working. You know, we don't like not doing things well. None of us do, right? Um, but it is where communication can be challenging. One of the things that I oftentimes will talk with people about, because for example, you know, when even checking in with your, the person you're providing care for or they're providing you, I mean, how many people really want it to go into, well, today, let me tell you how I'm feeling, right? Most of us say, oh, I'm fine, or I'm okay, or I'm good. One of the things that I, I oftentimes encourage people to think about is to like have code words for, uh, you know, oftentimes to even think about it like as a, as a stoplight. I know this sounds simplistic, but it really can be helpful. So there's green, which means it's a good day. I'm feeling good. Yellow, which is sort of like, well, you know, um, it's sort of getting at me, but I'm going on. Red is one of those days where you're putting one foot in front of the other. You're getting through the day, but oh my, you really do not want to be here. If you can have that kind of code word so that you can let people know what's going on with you without necessarily having to go into it, something as simple as that for, your, for the person you're caring for too can be really, um, can help just in terms of how you feel energy wise because for you as a caregiver, oftentimes, as Mimi said, there's can be really mixed emotions around, like if you're waking up that day and you're just sort of pissed because you have to deal with all this stuff again. And it feels like you shouldn't have that feeling, you know? So then that whole inner thing goes on, like, okay, you know, what's the matter with me? I'm not the one with cancer. I should be fine. I should be doing this. It's not how it works. But we like to pretend like, you know, we can put it in this neat little package. And that is where having someone you can talk with 
can be one of the first steps to say, I'm going to go talk with someone who can give me a menu of some of the things I can do so I can think about them and do things that work for me. But did you have something else you want to say? Yeah, and okay. then this is a really yeah. good question. Okay. Um, the other thing about the emotions is that emotions are not right, wrong, good, or bad. If you could look at them as it gives you information about where you are at any point in time, they actually are incredibly helpful. So here's the perfect example. You're walking down the street and you feel afraid. It tells you something about your environment, right, and what you should do next. So emotions, if you think about it that way, it will kind of as much as can be possible, get the guilt out, okay? Here's a really great question, which we deal with quite a bit. How do I let my wife know that our daughter will remember her and make sense of all of her goals, make sense that all of her goals will be followed through? That's a beautiful question. It's complicated, okay? It depends upon the age of your child. Certainly, um, and believe it or not, kids as young as five, six, seven start understanding that there is no such thing as a permanence to the world and that things will leave and that things will die, people will die. So one of the things is how do you leave a legacy for your children? Incredibly important. Part of that, the ideal way to do that would be to have conversations, to start having conversations, but those are incredibly difficult. How do I begin to have a conversation with my children to let them know what my hopes and dreams are for them when I'm not here? It's hard, that would be the ideal, but it's not always possible. Other ways would be to write letters. That's really a beautiful way to write letters about what your hopes and dreams are for your children. You know, this is my vision for you. You know, this is my hope and dream when you get to this age. This is an event that's going to be there, and I may or may not be there for you. Beautiful letters that they can then hold on to. It's a physical remembrance of where they are going to be at any point in time. I just gave um, something called a rose quartz heart to one of my patients. And I asked her to put it between her hands and in this rose quartz heart to embed all of her emotions and all of her hopes for her granddaughter that she may not see. And she gave it to her granddaughter and she told her granddaughter, when you hold this heart in your hand, I will be there. I will be there. So some kind of object that you can give would certainly be right. Other people do videotapes, but this is an incredibly important conversation. And for those of you that are gentlemen in the room, we actually at UNC have a program called Single Fathers Due to Cancer that has a lot of these conversations. So if you'd like to speak to me afterwards, that would be really great. Boy, some of these questions are incredible. Um, here's a really light one, mm -hmm. laughing. I recommend recording The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon and watch it when you can. Okay. I'm not endorsing Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon. I will. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> How do I find the balance when loved one doesn't feel well? I do everything. When he feels better, give him back the responsibilities? Yeah. Balance is something that we in America don't do well, period, regardless of whether there's someone sick or not. Um, it's really, really hard, but absolutely. It's part of being in a relationship with other people. It's sometimes you will take more, sometimes you will take less. But it's also for you being aware of that gauge, that gasoline gauge inside of you. And it may come a point in which you can't do everything and there's things that you can actually let go of and it's okay. You know, it's okay, or asking other people for help. But it is a fluctuation. I think for the person who's sick, they many times feel guilty that they're a burden to another human being, and that's really hard on them. So having that conversation, you know, what can you do? What do you want me to do? And again, it's a very fluctuating thing, so certainly having those kind of conversations. Another way, too, in, in addition to that, for um, you to allow yourself as a caregiver to take that, get that space that you might need, even when, you know, it may be a very critical time in terms of someone doing not very well physically or even emotionally, is that you are in this 
for the long haul. And you want to be in it fully for the long haul. And to be able to do that, you do need some respite. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you have that discussion about, let's, let's talk, oftentimes I'll talk with people about sort of identifying your inner circle. You know, most of us have sort of circles in our lives of people who are in our lives. So who are those one or two other go-to people so that you can send that text message to that's sort of like, okay, you know, this is one of those alert days. I need, I need for you to help me out, to back me up a little bit. Um, and, and that can be something that even if you never use it, for you all to know you have that sort of in your toolkit can be something that's really quite helpful to have that go-to person or even to have that person that you know at the end of the day you call or you send a text to and you let them know this was the kind of day I had because of course it's wonderful if all of you all are in relationships where um, you can discuss those kinds of issues with your loved one but that's not the reality for everyone nor should it necessarily be the reality in terms of putting on the person who is ill you, you know what you're feeling like you have to carry so that's where having that your identifying your circles of support can be really important too i'm going to let liz answer this one uh -oh. <laughs> it's complicated okay so the question is, where are resources to help me and my family as a caregiver? Example, I am married and have five young children. My husband and I both work, and I am the caregiver for my sister in another household. I need help in my own home while I'm away caring for my sister. This is unfortunately a huge reality of many people. It is quite challenging for many people and what I would um, encourage you to do especially if um, you know depending on where your uh, loved one is getting treatment finding out resources that they may have available this is where caregiver as advocate can be helpful so what I mean by that is for example and I know that this is variable depending on if you live in an urban community or a rural community there's lots of differences but for example there are for your sister loved one there are some services that provide meals to people who are in treatment they actually bring over a certain number of meals there are house cleaning services and while this doesn't address your needs at home it addresses some of the stress that you might feel about how to manage things there while you're not there. So that's one thing, is to make sure that the resources that are available to your loved one are being utilized. It's one, many, many cancer hospitals, big or small, have cancer resource centers. And so going in there and saying, I want everything you can you know, give me on what's available. Likewise, for you on the other end, and granted, you know, five young children is a lot to manage. You are to be commended, first of all, for managing that, working, and taking care of someone. And so that's where you acknowledging that you have a lot on your plate and being able to know that you need some support is fantastic in terms of having young children. If you do have friends that are through the school or through the preschool or through your church, it is where sometimes letting people know where your needs are can be helpful. It's hard for us to ask for help. You know, we are an independent people. We like to do things on our own. This is our culture. It's the way we're organized. And so it feels very challenging to acknowledge that you need some help and or that you should be doing it differently. But I can assure you having, I remember years ago having a, a friend who was in a similar situation who had, um, she had 
four boys under the age of seven, and she needed to go out of town. And I, I, you know, she asked if I would help, and I did. It was I, I did work really hard, and I was like really shocked. I had like two little girls, and I was really shocked at how much even little boys ate. Um, but it, you know, it is that kind of thing where ask the women and the men around you because they might be able to to figure it out. You know, it might not be ideal, but this is also one of those opportunities as families. One of the things I think we oftentimes as adults um, probably could do differently is like, for example, letting your children know, my, I'm going to take care of my sister. I know that this is makes it a little rocky for us at home. This is what's going on. We're going to be talking on the phone. We're going to be Skyping. You know, now with modern technology, it makes it easier. But we need to pull together to do this as a family. And you need to know that mommy's doing everything to try to manage it. But we need to work on it together so that you don't carry it all by yourself either. And that's true across the board. But And, and likewise, in your own area, if you are not living by your loved one, to call a local cancer center and see what kind of resources are available. Because for example, we provide caregiving support services and while, you know, obviously our first attention is going to go to people who are being treated in our facility, we have I have been contacted by people from who have exactly that situation and we will definitely you know work to try to help them to do some problem solving and to meet for some support so that's where I oftentimes and for those of you who aren't from this area it might be lost in translation but there's a another very um, big cancer center just down the road from us and oftentimes what I say is that when it comes to support services we're non-denominational <laughs> so um, it, we I do think that a lot of people who are in the supportive realm in oncology care identify the concern and try to get the need met so do you want to do another I think question that's okay any other questions that folks have? I do want to say, too, that one of the beauties of coming to a conference like this is acknowledging that you all are here in the room together. It can be something that feels quite isolating. It can be the kind of thing that it's hard, even when you have wonderful friends and wonderful family and like people who are wonderfully well-intentioned, you at some level know that they don't get it. A little bit like the video this morning that we saw, people just don't get it and that in and of itself can be a stressor. So I do encourage you too, if it's one of those kinds of things that you do feel like you could benefit from more support from other caregivers. There are peer-to-peer -peer type of programs available. I'm not sure, and I don't know if you know if there's that through this alliance, but there are a variety of other, or you know, like the different um, breast cancer programs that then have peer-to-peer -peer programs. So that's something else to think about. It only you might only use it once or twice. It might be all you need, but there are a variety of resources. So, well, thank you all for coming and I hope that you um, enjoy the rest of the conference.